Hey everybody, Miss Dumas here again today, and today we are going to talk about this place, the Monsoon Marketplace created by good old John Green. In reality, it is known as the Indian Ocean Trade Network, and today's review is going to be all about how this trade network started and why it was so important. So let's get going. All right, first of all, we do need to know that sea trade did not start with the Indian Ocean trade route. I mean, it dramatically expanded as a result of it, but it didn't start because of it. Sea trade was actually going on much earlier, especially in the Mediterranean Sea during the time of the Greeks and the Romans. And the Greeks and the Romans would use the sea to be able to gain access to luxury goods or trade for goods that they needed. So people knew how to trade on the sea before the Indian Ocean trade route. But as you guys can see on the map, that Mediterranean Sea, I mean, this is pretty limited. This is pretty regional. The Indian Ocean trade route is going to be much bigger. And here it is, the Indian Ocean Trade Network. And as you guys can see, this is what we call an interregional trade route because it involves a bunch of different regions going to a different bunch of different places in order to trade. So we've got China and we've got India and we've got the Middle East and we've got Southeast Asia and we've got East Africa. So this is trade route really does bring most of the Eastern Hemisphere together. But one of the coolest things about the Indian Ocean Trade Network is this was not a trade network that was developed by governments. This wasn't a trade network that was developed by countries. These were just individual merchants, maybe in Guangzhou or Malacca or Hormuz or Mombasa, who decided, hey, I kind of want to sail the ocean. I kind of want to go see what the rest of the world's like. I want to sell some of my goods someplace else. So let's go and try it. So it was basically individuals with a lot of initiative who decide to go out, sail these, the Indian Ocean, and see what they could gain for themselves, whether it be, you know, ideas or profit or whatever else. And it totally worked. And the coolest thing is, like, everybody just got along right? Nobody was trying to necessarily rip each other off or fighting for control. Everybody was just like, it's like the hippie trade route of the time period, you know, live in peace and love and everything else like that. So what Indian Ocean Trade Rep Network really takes off around 600 CE, maybe a little bit later than that. It's going to involve the biggest players at the time period, India, Middle East, China. So like the Tang and Song dynasties of China and the Abbasid Caliphate of uh, the Islamic world, the Dar al Islam and, you know, kingdoms who are in control in India. And we're going to see a lot of the same goods traded on the Indian Ocean Trade Network that would be seen along the Silk Road, spices, silk, tea, uh, porcelain, textiles. But the cool thing about the Indian Ocean Trade Network is because they were using boats, right, instead of like camels with camel saddles, they could carry a lot more products, a lot more goods. And so they ended up also carrying what we call bulk goods or everyday items that everyday people used on a regular basis. And so this wasn't just a luxury good trade route like the Silk Road was. And what made all of this possible were the monsoons. Now the monsoons, can't speak English. Uh, the monsoons were not the water. Are These are wind patterns, wind patterns, wind patterns, wind patterns. And so each uh, different parts of the year, the monsoon winds would blow. So here we see the summer monsoon winds, right? And we see that they are blowing from west to east. Now they didn't have a great lot of technology early on in the Indian Ocean trade route where they could like change the direction of their sails and sail against the wind. They had to sail with the wind at their back. And so during the summer months, you would have ships or boats in the Indian Ocean trade route sail sailing from west to east. And then in the winter months, you would have these ships sailing from east to west because then the, the wind would be at their back. And so here would be the ship and here would be the wind and the wind blows and it pushes the ship this way or pushes the ship this way. And that's how people had to sail. They would sail along the coastline with the winds at the back so that it would push their sails in a direction. But they were super predictable every single year and so sailors could rely on this to get from point A to point B depending on the time of the year. And also, like we said, improved boats were really important to the success of the Indian Ocean trade route, whether it was the Middle Eastern Dow or the Chinese junk. These were bigger boats. They were more stable on the water. And so you could carry a lot more product and not have to worry about capsizing, which is always important in sea-based trade. And then two major events lead to the tremendous rise of trade in the Indian Ocean, and that is the revival of China in the 7th and 8th centuries and the rise of Islam. So let's talk about those. So we know in Chinese history, you have a dynasty, it falls apart, we have a warring states period, then we have another dynasty, it falls apart, then we have another warring states period. And that's really what happens a lot in China. Well, um, when the Tang and the Song dynasties come to power after the last warring states period in the 7, 8, 7 and 800s, right, these are pre 
were really what we'd call cosmopolitan Chinese dynasties. They were definitely more open to trade than previous dynasties. They were a little bit more open to foreign ideas, at least in first. And so they actively encouraged trade. And so they got involved not only more on the Silk Road, but they're going to get involved in the Indian Ocean trade route as well. Specifically, their involvement is going to mostly deal with like Southeast Asia, which I'll show you guys on a map, and then a little bit into India, right? So they're definitely going to be more involved. And when the Chinese are involved, that means there's going to be silk, there's going to be tea, there's going to be porcelain, and there's going to be money or cash flow to help facilitate the trade. So this really helps encourage the growth of the Indian Ocean trade route. And then the rise of Islam does the same thing, specifically with the Abbasid Caliphate. Islam starts about 600 uh, CE. The Umayyad is the first caliphate. They're kind of involved in trade. But in 750 CE, when the Abbasids come to power, the Abbasids come to power, they are all about the trade. They are all about gaining knowledge and ideas and technology. And so they are trading via the Trans-Saharan trade route. And they are trading a little bit via the Silk Road. But they're trading predominantly along the Indian Ocean trade route. And because of their curiosity and their goal to get as, as many different things as they can, they are heavily active in the Indian Ocean trade route, which again encourages more trade. And all of this also leads to the rise of new players. Yay! Finally talking about someone different. Southeast Asia becomes really important in the Indian Ocean trade route. Like I said earlier, China, when they originally get involved in the Indian Ocean trade route, they are trading predominantly with Southeast Asia, which is right down here. This is Indonesia, by the way, and then also with India. So China starts getting Southeast Asia involved because what ends up happening is you have a group down here called the Malay people. This is the Straits of Malacca. And so the Malay people for centuries have been sailing up and down these straits. And so the Chinese would come down learned about the Straits of Malacca and then would sail through them because it took a lot less time to get into the Indian Ocean from the Straits of Malacca than it would having to go all the way down here um, into the Indian Ocean. And there's this group of people called the Srivijaya. And the Srivijaya uh, started as a little kingdom. They definitely had ambitions to be more. And what they ended up doing ready for this, is they ended up taxing ships that would come through the strait. So they already had access to gold and spices because it's Southeast Asia. But then as any ship that came in or out of the strait from whatever direction, they would tax. And because so many ships were coming through, the Srivijaya gained a tremendous amount of money. And from this money, they built up their kingdom. They had more people, a stronger government, a stronger military. And so as a result of the Indian Ocean trade route, we get a new empire in Southeast Asia way to go. But they are not the only ones that develop as a result of the Indian Ocean trade route. We also have East Africa and the Swahili city-states. So these cities along East Africa, they've existed for a long time, right? But they haven't been major players really with anything until the rise of the IOTN. And what ends up happening is you've got sailors from say India or the Middle East or whatever else. And when the monsoon winds are blowing from East to West, they end up hitting into the East African cities okay on the indian ocean and they kind of have to stay there because they can't sail back until the wind patterns change directions until we get the winds flowing from west to east and so they stay there until the wind patterns blow and as a result of staying there they actually develop bigger cities and so you'd have these cities like mogadishu or kilwa or mombasa and you would see a bunch of different people there because they had to stay there until they could go back to their place of origin so that's why if you watch walked into Mubasa or Mogadishu or Kilwa, you would see Muslims and Persians and Indians and Africans all living at peace with one another, right? All kind of gelling their beliefs, sharing their beliefs, sharing their cultural identities. And so you get a lot of cultural diffusion in East Africa and the Swahili city-states. And actually, you're going to see a lot of cultural diffusion in the Middle East, in Africa and India. Not so much China, because you know how they feel about foreigners and foreign ideas. But that cultural diffusion is a huge part of the Indian Ocean trade route and one that we've really got to focus on. So we've got religious diffusion first. We've got Hinduism and Buddhism coming from India into Southeast Asia. We've got Islam coming from the Middle East into the east coast of Africa, also into India and also into Southeast Asia. Uh, we don't see a whole lot of diffusion of Confucianism outside of East Asia, so that's no big deal. We have different sharing of knowledge. We know the opposites and the Chinese were really big about knowledge. Chinese was big about Chinese knowledge. The opposites were 
big on everybody's knowledge. And as they traded with different regions, whether it's Africa or Southeast Asia or East Africa um, or India, they would share their knowledge and their ideas. And so you had this huge technological diffusion, this huge educational diffusion. And this is really why the Indian Ocean trade route becomes so, so valuable to most people during that time period. Well, the Silk Road was cool and it traded amazing luxury products and some religions. It didn't have nearly the cultural diffusion impact that the Indian Ocean Trade Network will have. So that is a brief review of the Indian Ocean Trade Network. If you want to know more about it, definitely click on this link. It's a really cool site. It's an interactive map of the Indian Ocean Trade Route that gives you a little bit more information and cool visuals. So I would highly recommend that you go and visit that. If, as always, if you have any questions or any concerns, you can contact me at any time. And until next time, see you later.